Gregory, sing the song. Actually, Christian life is indeed very simple. <laughs> if we have a heart of thanksgiving, you know, we thank as we sing the first song, the opening song, say it all. If we have a heart of thanksgiving, then we will be a happy person. And again, second song is also very simple. That if we are in trouble, who would you want to walk with you? Jesus. That's it. You don't need to hear, listen to another sermon. So what I want to say is that actually Christian life is a very simple life. But somehow, <laughs> sometimes the scholars uh, make it to become very very uh, complicated, you know. And sometimes we can we get confused. So before I start to preach the sermon for this afternoon, let me ask you a question, sir. Do you want to have a good life? Of course, uh, Pastor, right? you ask the kind of question. Of course, we all want to have a good life. There is nothing wrong in wanting to live a good life. I want to live a good life also. But what is a good life? Do you constantly look out for people who are enjoying their life and try very hard to have their kind of, of life? Do you know what kind of life is truly a good life? Let us look to God's uh, word for answer. Let us do a bit of recap. Uh, last Sunday, in uh, Leviticus 25, we learned that God... Mm -hmm. Okay. God promised the Israelites that he will bless them with three times of harvest on the sixth year so that they will have enough food for Sabbath, the Sabbath year, and then also enough for the next few years. Now, the question, the question was asked, what do they need when they heard the promise of God that I will provide? God will provide uh, three times of harvest. The answer is faith, right? Which uh, uh, told us that faith and the Israelite must have faith. They need faith to trust that God will take care of them when they put God as the first uh, priority. So the next question is that what do they then do on Sabbath years when they don't do the normal works? This is the answer. They are to use the time, no need to work, huh? use the time to realign their relationship with God. And finally, during the year of Jubilee, they have all their debts cancelled and begin a new list of life. So Leviticus 25 gives us a wonderful picture of Christ's redemptive work on the cross. Jesus paid all our debts of sins and freed us to live a new life under God. Yeah. So how would God, that would be the next question, how would God expect us to live this new life? The answer is, is found in the last two chapters of uh, Leviticus. In Leviticus 26, God commands the Israelites to live obediently. That means putting God as the first priority, which preacher uh, highlighted last Sunday. And then in the last chapter of, uh, of this book, Leviticus 27, God wants the people to take our vows seriously. So this afternoon, we will look at Leviticus 26, the first 13 verses, which talks about God's promised blessings 
for obedience. And next Sunday, Preacher Chi Hong will cover God's promised curses for disobedience. Come, let us pray. Speak to us, O Lord, our Father in heaven. Keep the evil one away and open our eyes to see your truth for life. And cause us to obey so that, Lord, your promised blessings will be ours to enjoy. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. We know that blessings of God are the positive aspect of our Christian life. But different people may interpret God's blessing differently. For example, we may think that we are blessed, we are blessed by God when we are highly educated, having a well-paid job, when we are promoted to a higher office, for example, to become the next minister, huh? when we are healthy or live a long life, when we survive an illness, maybe a very serious one, huh? or accident, or when we are good-looking, well-liked and popular, or when we have uh, good employers uh, who treat us very well. So you see, while all these things may look good by itself, they may not be God's promised blessings for a good life. Well, let us find out the answer uh, from the 13th chapter, 13 verses of Leviticus 26, they read to us by Sister Ealing this afternoon. I have three main points to make regarding God's promise uh, blessing. First of all, God's promise blessings are not based on our good works. How do we know? This comes from the chapter before this. Leviticus 25. If you have taken notice, last Sunday, in verse 38, 42, and 55. Let's take a look, an example. Oh, sorry, the 55. Huh? God's blessings are not rewards for our good works. It is not a reward for services because as we learned from last chapter, last Sunday, that the Israelites were saved by God to be his servant. Verse 55 says, Therefore it is to me that the people of Israel are servants, slaves. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. This is a very important thing for us uh, to, take, to take note. Huh? The Israelites were slaves to do God's bidding. And then you will see in Luke chapter 17, verse 7 to 10, Jesus himself made clear the relationship between the master and the slave. He asked, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field after a hard day works, come at once, quickly, eh? and recline at the table? Rest, eh? Of course, the answer is no. Will he not rather say, means the master will say to the servant, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. Yes, of course. Master has the priority. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? No. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded by your master in this case, say this. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. As if he's saying, there is a privilege no, to be a slave. Just do it and be happy. 
So we are saved by God to be his servant. Even Paul himself also declared that he is the slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to obey God's commands to serve his purposes without counting on rewards from him. Do you know that? So there are implications here. The first one is that God's blessings are not legalistic in nature. We must not seek God's blessing through our service to him. Do not think that you are pastor, you should have a greater portion of blessing. Do not think that you are elder of the church, therefore you will have God owe you a greater blessing. Because you serve in the church, because you do this, because you do that. I think we should repent if we secretly harbor any desire to do our service, to use our service to God and expect him to give us the blessing that we may imagine. Even the tithes and the offering that we give it to God. And the other, the second implication is that our obedience must not be selective or based on personal choices or personal preference. I'm okay with being a good worker in the office, but not okay being a good parent or son or daughter at home. Partial obedience is disobedient as far as God is concerned. So repent if we pick and choose what to obey. And the third implication is that our obedience to God must not be for self-glory. We must not obey God to draw attention and make a name for ourselves. This is called prideful obedience. Have you heard of that? Humble bread. Bright about our humbleness. We must repent. If we obey to show that we are more spiritual. Our obedience to God is born out of the relationship of master and slaves. Know our positions. And must be rightly understood because our obedience to God is the glory of God. Now, this is re-emphasized in the first three verses of chapter 26. Let's us unpack. The first three verses talk about God's promised blessings are for God's glory. God wants to bless our obedience for his glory. God gives two sets of command in verse 1 and verse 2. Let me read to you. And pay attention. First one, he said that you shall not make idols for yourself or erect an image or pillar and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it. Why? For I am the Lord your God. Number Verse 2, you shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary again. Why? I am the Lord. So, what we see here is that this, two, this set of command basically sum up everything. It tells us, tell the Israelites that you don't make idols and worship him. You should worship me. How? You have to first keep Sabbath. Stop working, doing a normal work so that you can focus. Put me as priority. Worship me. Reverence his sanctuary means to worship him. I am the Lord. So these two commands form the foundations of God's purpose of rescuing the Israelites from Egypt and put them in the land of Canaan. God's purpose is to set them free from the control of the idols in their hearts so that they can live a life in worship of the true and living God. Idols are false God. Idols are nothing. If you worship idol, you worship nothing and you become nothing. Now, this turning 
from idols, turning from idols to serve the living and true God, demonstrates the power of God in doing good to the people and reclaiming them as his people of his kingdom. And this is going to be the new nation, a new kingdom, a new people under God. And God's powers that rescued the Israelites from Egypt will also, listen carefully, will also see them through to final victory and glory. How? If they continue in obedience to him as what? As Lord and Master of their life. That is why keeping Sabbath, listen carefully, that is why keeping Sabbath and worshipping God, which is highlighted here, is so important because as they continue to realign their relationship with God and remain faithful to Him by conforming to God's law, which God has set for them as a pattern for life. Now, God's favor or God's blessings will come upon them. As we see in verse 3, chapter 26, verse 3 says, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandment. Who is speaking? This is the Lord speaking. This is God speaking. And do them. I will bless you. He has the power. This God has the power to bless you. And we know that in this case, it means that if you don't worship idols, yeah, don't do the normal work on Sabbath, but trust me to provide. Realign your relationship with me. I will bless you. So what are the implications? First, we cannot serve two masters. As a deacon Sidong, I never, I didn't pack up with him. <laughs> I didn't liaise with him. Uh, he prayed. We cannot serve two masters, right? Jesus said that very clearly in Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote to the one and despise the other. There is no middle ground. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot have the best of the two worlds. Simply put it. So don't try to do the impossible. It is either God or either so if we choose to worship God, then God will bless us. So dearly beloved, if you have strayed from God, for whatever reason, please return to him as soon as possible. And for those who have been absent from church, absent from worship, Absent from personal devotion, please come back and have your Sabbath. And another implication is that God's promised blessings are privilege, not entitlement. God's people are not spared the suffering in this world. Nowhere in the Bible say Christians are exempted from suffering. In fact, suffering shapes our character. In fact, suffering strengthens our faith. Because when we suffer, we look to God. Only God can help us. In fact, God even ordains suffering. As we see in the book of Job. You know, Job suffered greatly as a result of what? as a result of a righteous living. So, prosperity gospel is unbelievable because we are making God's blessing as an entitlement. The third implication 
is that God's promised blessings are given according to his sovereign will. God will not bless us according to what we insisted, but what God has well intended for each of us in each of our circumstances. He is the Lord. So our problem, what is our problem in this area about blessing? Our problem is that we have this tendency to impose our will on God. We ask God to bless us with this. Bless us with that. Do you do that? Sometimes it can be very unconscious that we wanted God very much to give us the thing of our heart desire without examining our desire, is it the will of God? According to his word and directed by the Holy Spirit. So I think our problem is that we want to run before God. And at the same time, we want to run down God's authority. As we can see, God's blessings are not for us to demand. Do not demand the blessing that you want from God. But let God be God. Let God decide for you. Yes, you may pray that prayer, but you must have the faith. And if that is a believing prayer, then you should receive and accept in thanksgiving whatever the outcome may be. The outcome has to be according to God's own perfect timing, own perfect way, own perfect means. Whatever God deems fit. So, so far, we have learned that God's blessings are not a reward for works, but for his glory because of his sovereignty. So now let us look at the list of blessings God promised to the Israelites and learn the prophetic messages they carry. In verse 4 to verse 13, all the way to the end of the passage, God promised blessing come with the prophetic messages. This is important for us, especially when we read the history in the Old Testament of Israel. Verse 4 to 5. God said in verse 4, Then I will give you your rains in their season. God opening statement about the blessing that he's promised to the Israelite is rain, seasonal rain. And the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruits. Verse 5, your threshing shall last to the time of the great harvest, and the great harvest shall last to the time for sowing, the new planting again. And you shall eat your bread to the full. And dwell in your land securely, very safe and happy. Right? So the land, why is it that the rain, seasonal rain, is the first word of the blessing? Because the land of Canaan is a land of hills and valleys. Without rain, it would be a barren wasteland. So God promised to send seasonal rain to soften the soil, listen carefully, germinate the seeds, grow the crops, and feed the animals from one season to another, from planting to harvesting. So when a Jew planted their crops in the spring, the spring rain or the early rain, you read it in the Bible, was expected and necessary to germinate their seeds. Now, without this spring rain, there would be no hope of harvesting a crop. The spring rain represents the grace of God we receive in Jesus Christ to help our seed to germinate and grow. Now, it can also be compared to the spring rain that the apostle Paul, apostles, all the apostles receive in their time huh, by knowing, loving, and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the winter, the Jew 
could anticipate to receive rain that enhances their crops for the harvest. Now, this is also called the later rain. So it will be just as the seasonal rains germinate the seed and enhance the crops for the harvest, the promised Holy Spirit came upon the believers, which we, we, we read in the book of Acts, converting the souls and help them grow for the glory of God. So their new life, new convert. The prophet Hosea makes a wonderful prophecy which allows us to transfer this idea of the seasonal rains to the church and what will come upon us in the last day. Let's take a look. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Likewise, the apostle, the apostle James also mentions the season, seasonal rains in James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmers wait for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So the picture of the pouring of the Holy Spirit that convert our hearts and bring about a new and productive life, securely planted in God's kingdom, is in view here. Besides making us fruitful and productive, God also give us power and peace to live our life. Look at verse 6 to 8. Verse 6, it says that I will give you, God said that I will give peace in the land and you shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. None, nothing in this world will make you afraid. And I will remove harmful bees from the land and the sword shall not go through your land. Sword is represent warfare. Huh? And you shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred. Can you imagine that? A five person chasing uh, 100 people. And they shall fall before you by the sword. Five, sorry, five, and a hundred of you shall chase 10,000. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. So here we see that God promised that the faithful will be protected by his power and enjoy peace in their hearts. Nothing will make them afraid. Why? Because God will defend, God will defeat, God will remove evil forces that threaten them. So here we see the picture of the Holy Spirit controlled life is in view. Now, this is a very important concept. This is a very important doctrine that every Christian must comprehend, must understand. A Holy Spirit-controlled life is a life of victory. Nothing can move. Nothing can harm. How does the Spirit cause us to have power and peace? Paul tells us, that it is the word of God and our prayer to him. Now, as we see in Ephesians, yeah, Ephesians chapter 6, 11 and 16 to 18. Let me read to you. Paul said, put on the whole armor of God. Armor of God is, pro is provided by God. We cannot have armor of God ourselves that you may be able to stand against the scheme of the devil. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith in with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
we have a weapon in the word of God. The next weapon is praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Christians have the power and therefore Christians have peace. Now Paul is saying that if we obediently study the word of God and pray to God, We have the power to defeat the devil. We have the power to defeat the temptations of the world. Then we will have peace. Why? Because God's word and prayer, listen carefully, God's word and prayer are tools used by the Holy Spirit to help us to resist the temptations that we face every day and cause us to realign our relationship with God. So preaching of the word, IDG and prayer meeting are the three very important ministry in the church. And I thank God that TCEPC has been doing very well. Yesterday, we have consistently about 20 of us attended the prayer meeting. Elder Gregory trying very hard to tell us that please come, it is important. I hope and pray that there will be more to come. If we believe in prayer, we must pray. If we don't pray, it also means that we want to give up the power. We want to throw away the weapon and we want to surrender. The church will be blessed with the power and peace of God when these three ministries are well attended by the people in the church. So we must try, we must strive to do better in these three ministries. Finally, the picture of being made the people of God. Verse number nine, it says that God says that I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. Now this is the blessing of the great population. It speaks of God fulfilling his promise of a great nation to Abraham. The number of his descendants, God has promised to Abraham, will increase so greatly that they will be like sands and dust of the earth. There will be a great number of people come to the Lord if we obey God's command. The great commission that given to us to make disciple and the disciple in terms of make more disciples. That is the pictures that we are looking at. And in verse number 10, it speaks of a life of sufficiency in God, which means it's a non-stop supplying by the productive land. Enjoy what you have now. That's what is the tone of this verse. You shall eat all, all store. Long cap, old store, long cap, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. The news are coming, but you still haven't finished the old store. What does it mean? Ample supply, non stop supply. Just enjoy what you have now, not to worry about the next meal. Those who faithfully obey God will not suffer lack. Do you believe? And in verse 11 to 13, the blessing of living with God is in view. God said, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you. 
That means I will love you. I accept you. I will live with you. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. God will recognize us as his children. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be whose slave? Their slave. The slave of Egyptians. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and make you walk upright. These three verses give us the picture of God's living in harmony with his people. Finally, we see the big picture. This is the ultimate blessing for those who remain obedient to God. Whoever endures to the end shall be saved. We see God show his delight in his obedient people. Here, the redemptive work of Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are clearly in view. We get the picture of Jesus defeated the power of sin and Satan on the cross and the Holy Spirit is present in the believers on the Pentecost. So what are the implications? First, In order to live a blessed life, we need Jesus. We need Jesus not just be our Savior, but also be our Lord and Master. In other words, we must be prepared to obey Jesus, obey God's command, obey God's law. If we think, if we desire to have a blessed life. Secondly, Christians are to focus on obeying the Spirit's guidance because we are living in the age of the Spirit. We all have the Spirit as our comforter. The Spirit guidance and the directions, we must continue to be sensitive to this Spirit conviction because the work of the Spirit is to, have to keep to help us to keep in step with God and to do his bidding. Now, how is a blessed Christian life for God's glory looks like? It may be too small for you, but it is so important that I realize that I cannot pick and choose any of the verse. But to give you the full works, listen very carefully. Paul paints for us the full and complete picture of a good life that God has intended for all of us. Blessed be the God of and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. We are made to be the children of God through Jesus Christ. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, referring to Jesus Christ. In him, in Jesus Christ, we have redeem, redemptions through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us referring to the work of the Holy Spirit, the mystery, the mystery of his work, of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to, in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, in Jesus Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, eternal inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. 
in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believe in him, believe in Jesus Christ, was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Here we see very clearly is the promised blessing of God is the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise, once again, of his glory. So, dearly beloved, this is the blessed life God intended for his glory and for us to pursue. It will be a great life if we know how rich is the blessing God has blessed us in and through Jesus Christ. Recently, I celebrated my 70th birthday and this is the life I live. When I lost my father through accident at the age of nine, for unknown reasons, I did not cry. And my grandmother called me unfilial, a pussy outsu. Perhaps at the moment, I did not see any meaning or purpose in life. Listen carefully. In fact, I started thinking a lot about life. When I, when I was a teenager, I called myself a free thinker. So to me, life has no purpose. Life has no meaning. And I think that we just live and die and disappear into thin air. But at the age of 24, I heard that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says that there is a way. There is a purposeful life. If you believe in Jesus, and I prayed to ask Jesus to come into my life. So, at a moment, a free thinker become, became a Jesus follower. At a moment, I have God in heaven as my father through Jesus Christ. My life was reset. I attend church, I got married, and I served in the church. When the church wanted to plant a new church, I put up my hand and joined the pioneering team. I served in a new church with new people as deacon and then as elder. When I saw the need for more full-time workers, I quit my military career to serve full-time in the new church. When I felt that I need to know the Bible better, I went to study full-time in Singapore Bible College. When I was approached by TCEPC, I responded to the call to serve in this church with new people once again, but this time as a pastor. So, I have one life, one calling to serve in three churches. So whose idea was that? Not mine, of course. My idea of life was never like that. Never to be a pastor. Not to, not to say that to serve in three churches. Not even think of that. I was thinking of just live and die and disappear. No more. So this is indeed God's idea of a blessed and purposeful life to make the celebrations of my 70th birthday more personal and more memorable. I cycled 70 kilometers along East Coast Park on Good Friday, Good Friday morning. And I ran seven kilometers at Pasir Ris Park on Easter Sunday. Recounting God's blessings in each kilometers I covered, remembering the, and thanking God for how I have arrived at this point of life on earth, remembering how his holy word and my countless prayer have seen me through the thick and thin, the high and low, and the joy and sadness. 
So as I look back the 70 years that gone by, I realized that I have a great life. I learned that this is a, there is a very important thing every one of us must do in this life. Listen carefully. This very important thing is to find the true purpose and pursue it your whole life. The true purpose of life is to enjoy God's blessing of living freely in and through Jesus Christ. To enjoy God's blessing, we must let the Holy Spirit to use God's word to take control of our hearts and mind and direct us to guide us to do his bidding in our marriage, in our career, in our family, in our ministry. When we do God's bidding obediently and responsibly, the joy is tremendous. Just like the Chinese saying, the end of responsibility is the happiest thing in life. And I told my family this in our dinner celebration. I have a great family and I have a great life. I realized that my ability to live life responsibly came from the work of the Holy Spirit in every stage and situation in my life. In all that I have been through, I just knew, listen, I just knew that God, the Spirit, is in control of my life. And He, I believe, will continue to show me where to go and how to live the life beyond 70. Now you may ask me, Pastor, how do you know that the Holy Spirit is working in your life? Now this is the answer. When you know it, you know it. When our lives have Christ, then our lives can have true purpose. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to give your life and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to take over? Do not pursue life without God. What really counts at the end of the day is our individual relationship with God. If today I do not have a close relationship with God, then I, I will be a failure. All the ministry that I've done, the three churches that I have served, will go down to the drain. God's promised blessings are not the same as the blessings the world pursue. God's promised blessing is given to us in Jesus Christ and him alone. He gave us his life on the cross to save us. Save us from the power of sin. Save us from the power of idols and provide a new life with, a, with an eternal future. So just like the Israelites, we are to remain faithful to God who saved us and trust him to provide instead of being anxious about life. So for application, Ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. Not just Savior only, but be your Lord and Master so that you can listen and obey His command. Jesus cannot be your Savior if He is not your Lord. Set your heart to put God first and He will take care of your every needs. As the Bible says, for the Gentiles seek after all things, all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. God knows. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, will be given to you. So therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
I have end the message this afternoon. It will be good for us to just spend time, spend some time before you leave this worship hall. Reflect on the spiritual blessing God has given you in Jesus Christ and thank him. Think of the blessings that you receive as a result of obedience to God. For example, your marriage, your family, your study, career, relationship with God and with people. And then commit once again. Take this opportunity. I'm going to give you enough time to obey God. Tell God, Lord, I want to obey you. I don't want to be selective. I want to completely obey you. Step by step. There is no instant Christianity. There is no instant Christian life. Obey God in all aspects of your life and let him do his part of blessing you. So spend some time now and reflect. Come let us all rise to sing the closing song.